I'm just going to go ahead and lay this down. People will watch it later. They can come on if they want to. But today I wanted to talk a little bit about prayer can be a matter of life or death. Prayer can be a matter of life or death. My name is Thomas Terry, and I'm a pastor as well as an overseer of ministry in Door County, Wisconsin, and Green Bay, Wisconsin. And uh, for 41 years, my wife and I, myself first and then my wife later when we were married, have become advocates of prayer. And uh, today we see a lot of good things amongst prayer people and a lot of things maybe that they don't understand. And I wanted to talk just a little bit from experience standpoints as well as the Word of God concerning prayer. Uh, today we have people that, that would, um, they, they use the term intercessors a lot. Uh, an intercessor, uh, they say, is one who prays. Well, I call them prayers and because I, I believe this. I believe uh, there's lots of different types of prayer, intercession just being one of them. But I, I know that this, uh, this title will, will get some people's attention because the truth of the matter is over 41 years of experience, I have learned that prayer can be a matter of life and death. So if you're taking notes, you want to write that down. It's how important it is. And I'm going to read some scriptures first in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, where it says, Praying always with all prayer or all kinds. In the Greek, it says all kinds or all manner of prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. All right. And then if uh, we go over to um, Romans chapter eight, and while we're going to Romans chapter eight, let me comment on that. Actually, in the Greek, it says this praying, it says praying always uh, with all prayer in the spirit Actually, what it says in the original is praying, being led, being led by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit wants to lead us into prayer, and the Holy Spirit wants to lead us into the different kinds of prayer. Now, in Romans chapter 8, if we look down here, it's very important scripture. It says this in verse 26, likewise, the Spirit or the Holy Spirit uh, himself also helps our infirmities or weaknesses, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In the Greek it says with, um, with signs, it, uh, it, it, it brings out the term um, not, um, not known speech, getting over into other tongues, so on. And so he says, and and we know uh, he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now, I want you to notice in context, he's talking about prayer here. All things in prayer are working together for our good. I have made the comment over the years because I heard uh, several men of God early in my life say that God, it seems that the Lord is limited by our prayer lives. It seems like uh, the Lord is limited by our prayer lives. And I, I, that, that statement is a true statement. I found over the years, because if you understand that in the Garden of Eden, when Adam Eve sins, they, cre they cre uh, committed high treason and lost their position of authority. And God had given them authority over the heavens, or excuse me, the earth. And um, and so uh, the enemy, uh, Satan, came in and became the God of this world system. And so God kind of was on the outside looking in. <clears throat> and the way that people reach the Lord is by praying. And so as we pray and seek God, it gives him legal right to come in this uh, and help us. This is why there's so many scriptures, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. You have not because you ask not. You know, uh, God knows what you ask before you even ask, but yet you're supposed to ask. Um, and there's this long line of scriptures about prayer and you realize that the reason God does that is because you have to ask him before he can intervene. That's the way he set it up to work. It doesn't take away from his sovereignty and he, it's just the way he has chosen to work with us in the world. So we become a very important part of God's plan as prayer people. We become a very, very important part of his, uh, 
his his uh, plan in the earth. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some things that I've heard over the years, some things that I've experienced over the years, so that people can get an idea and understanding about how important prayer is. Prayer can be a matter of life and death. Different kinds of prayer. Sometimes you're interceding when you talk about some of this. Sometimes you're supplicating when you talk about some of this. Sometimes as a prayer of agreement, we might talk about that. But I remember uh, hearing the story of a missionary, and uh, they were down in Africa, and um, the guy that was the head of the missionary people down there tells a story about how um, they had a uh, these tribes out in the jungles that were very, very difficult to deal with. And every once in a while, uh, the tribe would come in and steal a little girl, as an example. And when that happened, if you didn't get to them within 48 hours or uh, whatever, then they were gone. You'll never see them again. And so uh, there was several of these little girls all of a sudden that, that disappeared. They found out that this particular tribe, that this really bad tribe, was had uh, probably taken them. And so they had to go, go and uh, uh, this man and his and uh, his protege decided to go and to try to get these girls. Very dangerous. But anyway, they went out into the into the jungle, and as they approached where this particular tribe was, they began to smell some really bad smell. And what this was was the uh, custom that this tribe had was that if you wanted to come in to see the tribe, the way they tested you, to, or whether you were worthy to do it, was to hang, they, they hung an animal, they killed an animal, hung it upside down, and let it rot. And you would have to, I know this is gross, but you would have to come in and cut a hunk of meat off of that putrid smelling meat and eat it. And if you could eat it and, and you didn't get sick, then you weren't demon-possessed and you could come in and, and ask them questions or, or uh, go and, and see the, the chief and so on. This is the way you had to do it. So, these missionaries knew that they had to get in there and get to these women somehow and try to try to negotiate their release, these girls. And so and they said, we're going to have to eat this meat. And so they, they went in there and they started claiming scriptures like <coughs> the scripture that says, excuse me, the scripture that says, um, as an example, um, well, well uh, drink any deadly thing and it shall not harm us. Remember that? They said, well, if you can drink any deadly thing, uh, we're just going to, I guess we can use that as far as claiming it for food, too. And so we're going to just say, Lord, protect the food, protect us from this, this food. Help us be able to eat this without uh, it hurting us so that we can get in and try to help these girls. Well, they went out there and they took the, the meat and they cut it off and they munched it down. They were able to hold it down and, and nothing happened to them. So the chief allowed them to come in to this particular tribal area. And they, of course, they saw the girls over there and all this kind of stuff. And so they begin to negotiate with the chief and the people of the tribe their release. And the way they did it is they said, we're going to give you this, this, and this, and this. And they had brought a bunch of trinkets and jewelry and different things that they could negotiate with and negotiate their release. And they, they, they agreed to that. But it was getting late, and they knew that they needed to get back home. Uh, these missionaries, and there's just no way they were going to make it. And you do not, the worst thing you could ever do in that jungle where they were was travel at night. You basically were, were, were uh, acquiring a death sentence if you traveled alone at night. Animals and wild animals and stuff would be hunting and so on, and it, it just was very dangerous. So they decided that they were going to go ahead and spend the night. And the uh, the chief of the village said, okay, you guys can spend the night. Here's a hut here. And you can sleep in there, and you can leave tomorrow with the, the women. And so they, they went to sleep, and they're sleeping, and all of a sudden they get woken up by the sound of drums. Now, they they knew some things about this from the area, and the guy that had lived there all his life, he said to this missionary guy, uh, he said, oh, man, he says that's not good. He says, well, what is it? And he says, they're playing these drums, and what that means is this is the death drum. And what, what that means is we're dead. They're going to kill us. And he says, apparently what has happened is the, the, the chief thought about this and thought, why should we 
give them these this women back when we have them here and we now they've given us these trinkets and stuff we just kill them and just keep everything and that was the thought that the chief had and so they were in trouble well <laughs> and so uh they just you know they said all we can do is just commit our lives in, into the hands of the lord so they they said a quick prayer and they had uh these guys were, were sneaking around outside the the hut they had these knife this great big bowl of knife and they could cut your head off with just one swing. It was very sharp, a dangerous weapon. They saw them sneaking around out there with these, and they knew, oh, man, they're coming after us. And sure enough, they were. Well, the missionary said, I'm going to go ahead and step out first. And so he stepped out. It was kind of funny, but he said, I closed my eyes waiting, you know, as after we put our, our, uh, our hands, uh, our lives in the hand of the Lord. And he said, nothing happened for a few minutes. And so I opened my eyes and I looked down and he said, all these natives were on the ground and they were going like this and saying something and found out that, uh, what's going on? What's on? Well, the guy came out who understood the language and he said, oh, they said, uh, <clears throat> they are worshiping you like you're a God. And he said, what do you mean? He says, they saw these two gigantic beings, which were angels, of course, around you when you came out, and they <clears throat> they dropped their weapons, and so they got to go and, and take the women and so on and so forth with them, and they even got to preach the gospel. That's a great story, but there's another side to that story. The other side of the story is the missionary, when he came home from that mission trip, and he was relating some of this. Uh, he used to keep good records about where he was every day, a journal. And there was a lady that came up to them and said, and asked him a question, said, what on this day, this day, this day, and this day, where were you and what was going on? And so he told them, and he says, that makes sense because he says on this particular day, at this particular time, me and my prayer group began to have a burden for you. And the burden came extensively that there was something very dangerous that you, you were, you were in trouble. You could have died if we don't pray and uh, you're in, in, in danger. And we begin to intercede. And I think we interceded like that for three days until, now listen to this, we prayed it through. And we had the victory. We knew we had the victory when we prayed it through. Now, there is a teaching going around still today, and they talk about praying through. And there's truth in that. <clears throat> but uh, praying through is not something you do every day, okay? It's not like I got to pray. Did Somebody says, did you pray through today? Well, no, you're already through. If you're a Christian, you're already through. You don't have to pray through. But what, what, what they were talking about when they, the old timers said, have, we prayed it through, was that God had given them a specific task of, or burden of prayer, this thing here for this missionary, and they had to pray for that until they got the note of victory. <clears throat> they had prayed it all the way through. And when they prayed it all the way through, there was a miracle. The missionary came home with the, the girls, and everybody was okay. Now, I always ask the question, what would have happened if nobody prayed? The truth of the matter is, they would have been a disaster. There would have been a death. They would have been a martyr. And many times over the years, something has happened to people, and people don't understand why it happened to good people. And the truth of the matter is, a lot of things, a lot of things, not everything, but a lot of things that we see where people end up dying prematurely or are, are dying some horrible death um, or some tragedy or sickness or whatever it is could have been avoided if somebody prayed. But people don't know and understand that prayer has to be made. It's not God's fault. He begins to react to our prayers when we pray, but he has to have the prayers to be able to react. Another time, I'll give you another one. This is interesting, but years ago in Oklahoma, they, there was people that um, worked on uh, oil rigs, still is today. And on the oil rigs, there was uh, a man that was an Assembly of God boy that worked on the oil rigs in what they called an oil gang they call them gangs. There was like about 12 of them, and they would work on, on the oil rigs, and they would pull up the pipes out of the ground. It was very dangerous work, but they, that's what they did for a living. Well, 
there was a, a down there in in Texas at that particular time. There was a pastor, uh, J J J uh, J R Goodwin or um, Pa Goodwin, we called him, and and Ma Goodwin, who were pastors of uh, this particular congregation, and they got home from ministering on Sunday. They had ministered Sunday morning and Sunday night, and she said. Man, well, I'm just exhausted. We need, uh, let's, we need to get to bed. So they went to bed. Well, he got woke up, and he, he heard his wife, and she was on the ground over there praying, groaning, just groaning and groaning and groaning. And so he thought, he, he thought maybe she was sick, and she, he asked her, are you sick? What's, what's the problem? She goes, no. She says, I just, she says, I got such a burden of prayer. She says, somebody is in danger. Somebody is in danger. She says, somebody is in, in our congregation is in serious danger. And so he said, okay, and he began to pray. And so they prayed over everybody in their congregation the best they could. And, you know, it took a while. And so finally he got tired a little bit and he slipped back to sleep. And then all of a sudden he woke up as, uh, again and she's, she is groaning. She's groaning and groaning and groaning, and she's saying, I cannot let it go. Somebody's going to die if we don't pray. There's going to be a disaster if we don't pray. She went on and on and on praying. This happened four times. And finally, the fourth time, he just got down with her, and they prayed, and they and they, they, they prayed and prayed and prayed, and, and they kept interceding. And finally, this thing lifted, and, and, and they, they began to rejoice. And they knew that they had prayed that thing through. Well, the next day, uh, one of the reasons they were praying for the people is they had five of them that were on a vacation, and maybe they thought maybe there's some danger in them traveling and stuff. But anyway, the next day, there was a, a, a man in their congregation, this Assembly of God Church, that was um, working on these oil rigs, and he, uh, there was a man in the oil gang there was 12 of them. There was only 11 that showed up for work. One of them was sick or something called in sick. And he was normally the guy that went all the way up to the top and did this stuff that was pretty dangerous. And so the the leader or the supervisor said to this young boy, this uh, Assembly of God kid, 28-year-old boy, he said, uh, today so-and-so couldn't show up, so you're going to have to go up. And so he went up, started going up, and he started climbing up. And he got about halfway up, and all of a sudden he came back down. And he said, uh, I can't go up there. And the supervisor said, what do you mean you can't go up there? I can't go up there. And he says, why? He says, well, last night, and, and when Ma and Pa Goodwin were interceding, they came to the place where they were asking God things like this. Lord, give them a vision if they're in trouble. Give them a dream if they're in trouble. Do something to, to, uh, you know, to, um, to uh, warn them. And so this boy is... This boy is uh, it comes back and he says, I can't go up there. He says, last night, I had the most vivid dream. He said, I dreamed that I went up the, the to this, this guy was not here. The guy, uh, you know, didn't come into work and that you asked me to go up. When I got up there, he says, this wire snapped and it cut my head off. And the supervisor said, what? And he told him that again. He said, well, he said, uh, you know, okay, so you're not going to go up. And so all of a sudden, this other Christian boy, now you have to understand, this man that was a, the Assembly of God guy was a spirit-filled Christian, all right, went to an excellent church where they understood prayer, they understood this. This other fellow went to this particular denominational church that was not a spirit-filled church. He loved the Lord. He was a Christian. And he said, he speaks up and says, oh, that's a bunch of, super um superstitious nonsense all that because he was always saying that about you know visions and dreams and tongues and the gifts of the spirit he was he was one of these guys who didn't believe in any of that he said that's a bunch of nonsense i'm going to go up he said i'll I'll go do this this is just superstitious nonsense well he went up got all the way to the top and sure enough that thing broke snapped off it cut his head right off the, the guy's head fell and hit the assembly god guy right in the back and he was killed instantly. Now listen to me. Both of those guys were Christians. God didn't love either of them more than the other. But see, one of them had a pastor that knew how to pray, that had interceded, had prayed the thing through. The other one was, you know, didn't listen, 
could have listened to that, but he was from a, a background where they didn't believe any of that, didn't pray that way, and he was instantly killed. And people ask questions, well, why did that good, good Christian die? Well, many times it's because nobody prays, because whether we pray or not can be a matter of life and death. And in that particular case, it was life for one guy and death for another. Both believers, this is why you should not mock spirit-filled people. If it was not for spirit-filled people who pray in the spirit, um, this, there, you think it's bad right now? You would have turmoil so bad out here, you, you wouldn't believe it. There would be so much going on. And many times... Many, many times when people pray, we avert tragedy, at least some of it. Maybe not all of it, but sometimes we stop things. Sometimes we hinder things. Sometimes things aren't as bad as they would have been. And this is, if we can get everybody praying, and we can get everybody so God could dump this burden on them and they could pray it through, we would have more and more miracles and less and less tragedy. I remember I'll tell this story quite a bit. This is one that happened to me personally. I'll tell two that happened to me personally. Me and my wife were uh, pastoring a church in Reno, Nevada, and we had a good growing congregation. And And one day we started getting this burden. And, it, and we knew, both of us at the same time, we were praying and we could not shake it. It was seriously, we knew that somebody was in trouble. Seriously, we knew that it could be a matter of life and death. We knew this. And I think we prayed that way for about three days. Just could not hardly sleep. Up in the morning, we were praying, praying, praying. Finally, about the end of the third day, we prayed it through. We got the note of victory. We felt whatever it was lift off us that we had, we had the answer. Well, what happened was one of our boys, who was a captain of a Federal Express, uh, uh, you know, he would fly planes, Federal Express, he was coming into Washington, D.C. This made all the papers. This was on the news. He came into Washington, D.C. Something happened to the plane. And he had six members. There were six people on the on the plane. And when he hit, he hit hard on the, the tarmac and the, the, the plane bounced. And then it flipped over on the, on the back. And it just rolled down the, uh, you know, the runway sparks and everything and then it bursted into flames and started to burn and let me tell you something not one person was injured it was just they were calling it a miracle and that's what it was and the man that was our our boy who was in our church that was uh flying that plane was a marginal christian i know he was a believer but he was a marginal believer at that particular time i tell you what that got his attention and he, he turned into a uh turned on christian after that but uh if we would not have prayed, we would have had a funeral. Let me say it again. If we would not have prayed or somebody else would not have prayed, we would have had a funeral. I wonder how many funerals we're having that were unnecessary. It's a good thought. Now, you're going to have the people out here in some denominational churches and stuff that are saying, well, God's sovereign, you know, yeah, bah, bah, bah. No, God's sovereign to his word. He does he he does things in line with his with his word his covenant and if you don't understand that you don't understand god god is a covenant god we have covenant promises but our part is to allow him to use us and to move through us and this is so vitally important for us to hear at this particular time we need people you me others that are going to take on the burden of prayer and god can assign us prayer things so that we can pray them all the way through. Now, you don't do that every day, but when he puts that on you, assigns you to something, that, then it can be a matter of life or death or tragedy. The difference between somebody being crippled and somebody not being crippled. It can also be somebody being healed or not being healed. You can just go down a long list. We need people that can yield to the Spirit of God. Let me tell you one more and then I'll let you go. You need to realize that what I'm telling you right now is absolutely vital because somebody will hear this and blow it off or somebody will hear this and say, oh, well, that was good, but it's not for me. God gives warnings. Many times he'll give warnings to people. He'll prepare them. He'll warn them. 
And if they're if they really think about when a tragedy happens, they think back. God says something through somebody that could have avoided that. That's why I felt this morning I, or this afternoon I needed to share this. I don't know, man. I don't do much Facebook Live in that much anymore. Maybe I should do more. But I felt like this was important enough for me to go ahead and share. There's somebody needs to hear this, maybe more than one person, and we can avoid a tragedy. My wife and I had just uh, married not too long, and I had a friend that I led to the Lord in our uh, in, in my job. He was the only guy that I led to the Lord in the seven years I was there. Uh, but, you know, he came over and was, was part of our lives, and we would pray sometimes. And at the time, I also had another friend who was not a, a believer yet. And this particular friend of mine, he, his father and his mother were like parents to me. I was close to the family. They were not believers. I had just got saved uh, a few years, uh, uh, you know, and so I, uh, they weren't believers yet. But I still loved them, and we were still close. And I still communicate a lot with them. And my wife and I decided we were going to pray that day. Now, this is in Los Angeles, and it was hot. Okay, it was like 95, 100 degrees outside. And my other friend came over, and there was three of us. And we closed the the windows. And we had, uh, it was an apartment, and we had uh, blinds. You know, blinds that came down that you pull on and so on and so forth. And we shut the blinds. And there was nothing going on except air conditioning. And air conditioning did not blow stuff around like that. But we're sitting there and all of a sudden we're starting to pray and I get a telephone call. I felt impressed to answer the phone. Normally I probably wouldn't. But I picked it up and it was my friend. It was my best friend. He, I, we were closer than the brother. And I knew something was wrong because it is normally a really uh, happy-go-lucky, positive person. And the first thing he said to me is, my father has went in to the hospital. They're going to amputate one of his legs. They found a blood clot. And they're afraid it's going to break off and go to his brain. So they're going to amputate his, his leg. Can you please pray? Now, you have to understand, he wasn't a believer. And, you know, he was a little mocking sometimes and thought I was crazy. But, you know, that's how, how that happens when people need something. They come to us, full gospel people. Uh, this was a desperate need. Uh, the doctors actually said this. They said, we're going to amputate his leg. We've got to do it quickly. If we don't, he has a 50-50 chance of dying. And he told me that. I said, we will pray. And I, I hung up the phone and I was very, you know, all of a sudden just, just um, sober. I mean, sober-minded. Just, just just came all over me. And all of a sudden... Well, I, I was explaining this to my, my wife and this man, and we needed to pray about this. All of a sudden, it was like a wind blew into the room, and the blinds went, whoo, and when that happened, all three of us fell out under the power. The power got hit us, and, and we all fell out, and we started interceding, and we started groaning. The only way I can describe it is it, it was like... Nothing I could really describe. It was, it was, it was like, I, I felt like I was going to die. I felt like the father felt. I felt like the mother felt. I felt like my friends felt. I felt like the brothers felt. I took on that feeling of how Jesus felt about it. Uh, I was digging my hands into the carpet and I was I was pulling on the carpet because it, it, it was almost painful. I couldn't. It was like I almost couldn't stand it. I, I don't want I don't, don't want to sound mystical, but it was almost like you know. I mean, I could sense the heaviness and presence of God. So that was that was great. But I was under this this prayer thing, and I was groaning, and we were all doing it, and I was like almost tearing the the rug out. It was so intense, and this went on. I don't know how long, and. Then all of a sudden, bam, it lifted. We had prayed it through. And we started rejoicing and praising God. And I, I thought, well, we got the answer. We got the answer. Well, not too long later, I got a call from my, my, my friend again. And he said, well, thank you for praying. This is what happened. He said, um, when they, they came to take my father in to amputate his leg, for whatever reason, 
the doctor said, I want to take one more quick x-ray here so I make sure I know where this, this, all this is and, and if it's moving or not. So they put him under there and they took an x-ray and they could not find any blood clot. They, they did all kinds of tests, could not find anything. And the next day, they couldn't find anything. Nothing, nothing was there and they released him. They released him. Now, that's not coincidence. That He could have died, literally. He could have died. It could have been a tragedy. He could have lost his leg. But prayer, my friends, can change things. So whatever you're facing, whatever God puts on your heart. Now, this is not something you can do. I'm not talking about regular prayer here where we pray earnestly for things and sometimes we do and and you know that's fine i'm talking about when the holy ghost leads us into an area where there is something that has to be changed or there's going to be a tragedy you'll begin to feel this burden rise up on the inside of you i think thousands of christians probably experienced this during 9 before 9 11 before school shootings and so on and so forth but they're not sensitive many of them to what's going on they just feel like something's bad Something's wrong, you know, and they don't yield. And we need to yield to prayer because what God is trying to do is change the situation. Maybe change the totally, maybe change it somewhat, but whatever, we just need somebody. He's looking for somebody to pray it through. How about you? Are you a candidate for that? I just dropped my stuff on the ground. Are you a candidate for that? I hope so. Until next time, this is Pastor Tom. We love you. Share this with a friend. God bless you.